Hari yere gosirelinir. Şaçınar gal çun serner gal çan hamar. Hello all and welcome to the program of Armenian Studies final event this academic year. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Professor Kazurari for accepting our invitation and coming to speak to us today about the writers of the Armenian genocide. Professor Kazurari is a professor of Armenian literature and language at the University of Geneva, where she established the first Swiss chair in Armenian studies. Kalzarari was awarded a degree in classics from the University of Bologna in 1988, graduated with a History of Christianity degree from the University of Lausanne in 1991, and became Doctor of Armeniology at the Catholic University of Milan in 1995. In January 2012, she received the Diploma of Honour from the Ministry of Education and Science of the Republic of Armenia for her Armenological Studies. This lecture focuses on the Armenian writers who wrote their testimonies soon after the events of 1915-1916, namely in the period between 1917 and 1922. These writer survivors considered the act of writing as a means of resilience and a duty. During the deportations, they collected information such as voices from the other deportees they met on the road, images taken on the path of deportation in the camps, and so on. First and foremost, they set out to make what happened known to give an image, to write a book image. Considering themselves to be carrying a legacy, they tried to put into writing the cursed days of the deportation. But how would it be possible to tell, Batmel, what is actually un Batmeli, that which cannot be told? This lecture will give a voice to those writers and propose some parallels with the writings of survivors of the Gulags, the writer Shalamov, and the Shoah, the writer Levi. It's thus with great pleasure that I introduce Professor Kazarari to speak now. Thank you very much. <laughs> this is a very kind presentation and uh, I have to say that I'm very impressed by all the activities that the Armenian Studies program organizes uh, every year. So I'm very glad uh, uh, to be here with you, you. and uh, I hope that uh, my English will be understandable. I feel much more comfortable in French or even in Italian, it would be even better. So uh, I have to read my text but uh, you can <coughs> uh, interrupt me if something is not clear. And I, will, I would like to thank especially Krikor uh, Moskofian and, uh, for inviting me and uh, he told me you can choose uh, whatever topic you want. So I decided to propose to you an extended, extended version of a lecture that I already gave at the University of Zurich. So why I'm doing the advertisement for another event? Because it was a very important event. It was in October. Uh, it was last year, and it was a symposium organized by historians about Armenian genocide in the context of the Ottoman cataclysm. And they decided to organize a panel. The title was uh, "How to Deal with Crimes Against Humanity," and they decided that literature also, also uh, a, a way to 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 resist uh, to a kind of response to the Armenian genocide. So they invited me, and uh, they wanted that I um, propose some remarks on this subject. Subject, and this is a very very important fact. So it is the reason why I'm stressing. That I would like to stress with some water, some words uh, by Krikor Belelian. I know that I, I don't have to introduce him, and it is a very good friend of all of you here in uh, at the uh, SOAS. And uh, he gave uh, uh, very recently an interview, online interview, so you can find it. And uh, he stressed that uh, there is a general situation in the academic uh, world from the 80s. 80s. It was the, the beginning of the interest for the genocide studies and uh, from that time there is a lack of interest for the literature, for the literature written immediately after the genocide, for, written from uh, uh, writers, uh, survivors. And uh, so he wrote L'historiographie du génocide était en train de se mettre en place, it is the, the red part, pour finir par occuper tout l'espace du discours sur l'événement et la littérature où il y avait matière à travailler, la littérature arménienne de la catastrophe, so, the word, another word, uh, la littérature de la catastrophe n'était jamais abordée. So it seemed to me, one year after the anniversary of the genocide, to stress that something maybe is changing. So even uh, to very big symposium about the Armenian genocide, Ottoman cataclysm, even the specialists of literature have, have something uh, to say. So much more interest for the literary phenomenon and it is very uh, important thing and I wanted to um, draw your attention to that. And actually, literature was a kind of response to the Medzieheren. 
If you read the accounts of the Armenian writers who survived in 1915 or who managed to escape from Constantinople before the arrest of April uh, uh, 24, we may understand the great importance they ascribe to giving testimony in writing to what they experienced. They explicitly wrote about how much they felt called to accomplish such a written task. In my lecture, I will not deal with the question of testimony in general, it is a very big question, but I will deal only with some of the testimonies by, uh, written by Armenian writers. This case involves a different question, it is the power or even the legitimacy uh, of literature itself which was challenged by this enterprise of writing. In any case, that was a widespread feeling amongst many of these Armenian authors, uh, as we will see. First of all, some, okay, this is some water. I'm very proud to show you. I took myself with my camera, the Nubar Library in Paris, a very important lieu de mémoire and lieu of uh, important um, place for, for the scientific people, for the Armenian, for the diaspora. And I took myself some uh, images so, of the, some pages of the works that I, I have the pleasure to introduce uh, to you. So I, we will see later. First of all, some words about the vocabulary. Mez Yecheren, the writers uh, that you saw in the, in the first uh, slide, created a new term, a neologist, Yecheren Abadum. It was the first time that they created this word. They had in the Armenian vocabulary, of course, the, the word Yecheren, which is a war with a very, very, very long uh, history. The dictionaries uh, learn us that Yecheren means crime, so it is a synonym, synonymous of uh, Vogir, massacre, catastrophe even, er, especially evil, the evil par excellence. Badum came, uh, comes from badmel, the, vo the, the verb who means, uh, which means to tell, to relate. So Yecher na Badum is the act to tell, uh, the Yecheren. If I had to summarize in a few words the literary form uh, mostly employed in the first accounts by the writers uh, I wish to introduce to you, I would like to follow a kind of possible typology well, a typology that uh, we have the possibility to apply to our text, a typology uh, created by Liuba Jurgensen. It is a colleague uh, in Geneva and in Paris, and uh, she is a specialist of the literature uh, of the Gulag, so the survivor of the Gulag and also of the Shoah uh, literature. And uh, she distinguishes between what she called the livre en, liv uh, books one, livre image, books images, books, um, the aim of, uh, uh, of which are uh, to, to show the events. So the question that these books uh, um, uh, pose is how the facts happen, how the facts happened. She distinguished these uh, kind of books, for example, Solzhenitsyn, One Day in the Life of Denis Denisovich, or Sequeste un uomo by Primo Levi. This is some example of the livre one, so books, images. They want to show the events. They want simply to show the, wings, the events. And uh, uh, Liuba Jurgensen distinguished that from the livre de, livre reconstitution. The question is different. It's not how. I don't want simply to show you. I, I want to understand why. So there is a very different crucial question, why the facts happened. And the reality of the camps, of the deportation, become a subject, a field of, uh, of study, of uh, reflection. And we have another work by Solzhenitsyn, the Gulag Archipelago, and uh, by Primo Levi, uh, I Sommerse Salvati, he wrote this uh, work many years after Sequestro Nuomo. And, well, uh, you can find this uh, quotation uh, by Luba Jurgensen, but we don't have uh, the time to read it, so I wanted to summarize. And uh, I think that we can say about the, the writers and the, the writings uh, written by the, the writers of the first generation after the, the 1915, we can say that we have mostly books, images. The Armenian authors, focused on describing the event themselves, relating a chronological order. 
During the deportations, they collected information, voices from the other deportees they met on the road, images taken on the path of deportation or in the camps. First of all, as I uh, already told, they wanted to make the events known, show them, give an image of them. And in this respect, the vocabulary employed by these writers is very interesting. But Ger, I guess that everybody understands their meaning. So in any case, you have the, the translation. Everybody understands it. In any case, you have the translation. So you have to learn their meaning, by the way. So <laughs> but Gerner, <laughs> images. So you, you may uh, think about a photographic style or the call about the writing telling, I, I wanted to write some impressions, I wanted to write, I wanted to give you some images of Bad Gerner, I wanted to uh, summarize some episodes to Wagner or simply to share with you some memories. So there is an idea of fragment fragmentation, of fragmentation. It is impossible to give a totality of the testimony. And a book image reveals also another attempt. So a book who wants to give images of the event without any commentary, without any reflection about that. A book image reveals the attempt to shorten the chronological gap between the present of the narrative and the past events in order to reproduce or to try to reproduce an effect of simultaneity and to carry the reader into the events as a witness. So they, they, these authors, wish that uh, we also <coughs> became a witness uh, of, the, of the events. And it is, of course, the challenge uh, they had. So some information about writers and works. So you have some names, Yervan Todian, Grigoris Balakian, Aram Andorian, Mikael Shamdanjan, Merujan Brasamian, Teotik Zabel Esayan, et cetera, et cetera. I will not speak, of course, about all of that. I made a choice. First of all, Zabel Esayan. I don't know if you are familiar with this uh, also. In any case, Zabel Esayan, she was born in Constantinople at the, well, you, you have the, 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 the date, so uh, the same um, year of the, Treaty of uh, San Stefano in Berlin, and uh, she she liked to to remind that, and uh, she passed away in the Stalinian Gulag. We don't know in uh, which uh, age. In 1915, it was a celebrated writer and a prominent personality in the Armenian Constant Constantinopolitan community. Some years before, after the massacres of 1909, she was sent to Cilicia after the massacre of the Armenian Cilicia, Adana, Mersin, etc., as a member of an official Armenian delegation organized by the Patriarchate and the Red Cross. There she did significant work in favor of the orphans, and two years later she published In the Ruins, Averagneron Mech, and you have an image of the first edition of this uh, work. In the Ruins, Isabella Sayan recorded in this work what she saw and try to give a voice to Armenian mourning. She did not experience the death marches. She managed to escape from the Ottoman Empire, first of all, to Bulgaria. And it is in Bulgaria already in August, September 1915, it is very important, that she wrote some memories, once more memories, Ishada Garner, of the, the famous uh, night of the April uh, 94. And uh, she published these memories under a pen name. Of course, th there was a danger to give this kind of information. So she chose um, the name of Viken, so uh, a masculine name. And uh, she was compelled to interrupt this uh, publication, but it's very important to uh, remind this uh, writing because uh, it's uh, almost unknown to the to the public. Some years later, in 1917, so after the genocide, she published Jorobordime Hokevarke, Agony of a People, and she changed totally. We have some uh, essays about this work by Mark Nishanyan, by uh, Krikor Beledian also. She changed her her approach to the catastrophe, to the, to the genocide. She chose to record the testimony of somebody, somebody else, of one Haig Toroyan, another survivor from the desert of Mesopotamia. And she wrote a preface, and she gave her signature in this preface, when, where she explained her approach to the, to the, to the testimony. 
And there is another very important fact uh, to, to stress. The recipient of the text uh, is different. In the ruins, in this work, Yesayan addressed you all the compatriots, meaning the Ottoman compatriots, including the Armenians and the Turks, well, the Ottoman compatriots. In the agony of a people, Yesayan addressed the Armenian readers, as well as to the foreign readers. Of course, it was uh, the idea of a possible common homeland was no longer viable. So it is very interesting to see that the receptions of the texts are different. So Agony of the People, it was written for the Armenian readers uh, as well as to the foreign readers. And it was written in Armenian, so there is an, uh, an aporia in this, uh, in this question. Yervan Todian. So Yervan Todian, he was born in Constantinople, another survivor <coughs> of, the, of the catastrophe. Uh, he was very well known uh, as an author of uh, satiric uh, novels. Uh, he, he was a prominent uh, journalist. Uh, um, he collaborated with uh, Jean Manag. And uh, he wrote in 1999, The Cursed Years, Personal Memories, 187 episodes published in 187 numbers of the newspaper Jamanag, and another um, critic, another specialist of literary writer himself, Agopo Chagan, never forgave why this kind of testimony published in a, in a Terton, in a Phaeton. For him, it was something unacceptable, but well, it was one of the kind of publication of the time, so why, why not after all? In any case, we had to, well, this is the first number of the Anizial Dariner, so this work, and we, we had to wait until some, well, well, 12 years ago, more or less, uh, before having w all these uh, episodes in one volume. And it was published in, in, uh, in Armenia, in Yerevan, so it is interesting. In uh, his work, um, Odian describes well, what he see, the epidemics, the disease, the sin, scenes from hell that, uh, I quote, any Dante wouldn't have been able to imagine. He testimonies about the dehumanization of men and women. He wrote about uh, the trafficking of women and children, the struggle for survival, even at the cost of other people, people's lives. He did not provide any commentaries on the events he described, so a book image once uh, more. After him, another author, Monsignor, how do you say in, in uh, English? Bishop. Bishop, Archbishops, much more high. So, <laughs> so Grigoris Balakian, he was born in Tokat, and uh, he was also uh, deported to, to Mesopotamia, and uh, thanks to his knowledge of the German language, he pretended to be a German, and uh, it was uh, the beginning of a long journey as a fugitive. In September 1998, uh, he safely came back to the capital. Still in Constantinople, he began to write the account of the deportation in a work called the Armenian Golgotha. Episodes, uh, once more, episodes of the Armenian martyrdom. So the first volume was published in Vienna, but some years, uh, only some years after the genocide, so in 22, 1922. And you have the, well, the title, so the, we have the manuscript of the work of uh, Balakian still in, uh, in Paris, the first pages, page. And I, w I would like to remind at least some information about what we can um, call the new start, of course, and short new start of the literary activity in the capital after October 19, uh, 1918. At that time, after October, so it is the year of the armistice uh, of Mudros, uh, Constantinople was under the control of the Allies, so it was possible for the Armenian survival, of course, to come back to Constantinople. And there are years of hope. These uh, Armenians hoped that it was possible to start again. And it was possible to start again, uh, for example, a literary activity, the activity of the, the journal. They founded, in 1922, they founded a new literary journal. It is very important. So they had the, the espoir, the hope to, that it was possible to begin again. The Almanac of Theotique, it was another 
periodical, the periodic that every each Armenian family had in uh, its uh, home. And in the first number of the, the genocide, so the year was uh, in the 19, 1920, Theotique added a new literary column and the title was Totally New Articles, Writings, Memories, Letters and Interesting Pages by Our Writers. Disappeared or Martyr or survivors. You have, for example, another column, another uh, column published in the Shant, another periodical of, um, of the Constantinople in November, November, so one month after uh, the Armistice of Mudros, the Armenian Pantheon, the last great martyrs of our nation. So, there is a kind of um, a willingness to give to the Armenians uh, lost in the, in the Syrian, Syrian deserts uh, to give a burial to the Armenians. They didn't have the burial. And the place was the literary place. It was this, this journal was the place to give a burial. Well, you have some images of the first number of the Almanac of uh, Theotique. So the first number, this was the frontispiece of the, the, the new column that I mentioned. And uh, I would like to remind the memorial for April 11, uh, also directed by Theotique and published in Constantinople in the same year, so in 1919. So it was, it is important to stress the fact that there was the hope that it was possible to start again and that it was possible to start again a literary activity and what kind of literary activity they choose mostly these authors. A literature of témoignage or te testimony. So they wrote, they felt, as I told uh, at the beginning of this lecture, they, they need to write about the experience of the genocide of the deportation. And we have the possibility to find very interesting um, excerpts. Staying alive in order to testify, this is the title that I choose for this part of my lecture. Um, and uh, why I, I choose this, uh, this expression, staying alive in order to testify in mostly all the works of my, my writers, I would like to say, you may find words some so like uh, requirement, duty, so the duty of writing, bardavorutiumene, it is a duty to write about the, the genocide. Uh, or you can find words uh, some like a promise, pledge, pledge or promise uh, to the comrades of deportation. I will promise that if I will have the chance to survive, I will write, I will write about uh, our experience. Or the word legacy, um, I inherited as a legacy the, the, well, the duty to write about the genocide. There is another interesting, interesting word, a verb, vijakvil. It comes from Vijak. It is a, a very strong word. It means uh, fate, lot, destiny. So the Yeher Nabadun, the written uh, tale about the Yeheren, is a Vijak. It's something to which it is impossible to escape. It is something who uh, can fall upon you, even if you don't want. It is impossible. You have to write about these experiences, these events. Well, it is a, a duty, it is a legacy, it is a promise, but it is a very difficult enterprise, this enterprise of writing. It is a challenge. And uh, um, these authors, for example, Balakian, who address his work to the Armenian people, to you Armenian people, he... Um, he wrote this uh, very interesting statement. I wrote because I received the sacred legacy by your dying children, your children of you, the Armenian people. I was requested by all people who were on the thorny path of the Armenian Golgotha to write the Anbadmeli, unutterable Yeher Nabadum, or Yesayan, about Haik Toroyan. He felt he had a sacred depth Surpazan Bartme, imbued with this feeling, he approached all groups scattered here and there, he listened all the suffering voices, and he saw all the atrocities of these unutterable pictures, Anbad Meli Bad Gerner. And he reached us 
bringing with him the last lamentation of a people disappearing in unutterable terrors. And again, Balakian, I suffered through all the tribulations with pleasure, so that a thin pillar or one more stone may still be standing in the destroyed temple of the Armenian race, and that one more living witness may remain in this appalling Armenian tragedy. So even during the deportation, he felt this duty. I suffered the tribulation because I wanted to stay alive to testify and that one more living witness may remain in this appalling Armenian tragedy, but in order to testify. Uh, well, I have many, many examples in the same, uh, we, we, which express the same idea, so we don't have the time to read, uh, to read them. But I would like to, to uh, draw your attention to another, another, uh, another side of this uh, writing. Balakian, or the other writer, um, reminded that they had, in, in some way, this book already in their mind, even during the deportation. I hope it is clear. So one thing is, uh, I want to stay alive in order to write my book, in order to, testif to testify. Another thing is to say, well, I, I have to collect some information. So I want to record all, and this is the draft or my future book if I will stay alive. I expended all my effort and energy in the process of harrowing mental record, keeping, classifying and rooting firmly in my memory, one by one, the frightful episodes I had just heard described. If by the grace of God I managed to survive, I would one day be able to make good use of all of that I had seen and heard. Of this I was deeply convinced. So I expended all my effort and energy in a process of harrowing mental record keeping, etc. Classify, not only keeping, but classify. There is a work on organization. With a painful, already uh, also, um, also Balakian, with a painful endeavor of memorizing, I tried to record and anchor in my mind the terrifying episode of the martyrdom of my race in order to disclose them one day if I succeeded with God's help to stay alive. Having a sharp memory, I stored in it. Uh, I store in it all the principal events of my exile and all of the relevant details. I continually ruminated and mentally recorded everything. So during the deportation, during these days, during these days, I decided in the event of my survival that I would write the horrific story. And I decided that the title of this story would be Armenian Golgotha. So there is a kind of draft, unwritten draft of what uh, would have, have been the, the book after. And we, it is possible to find some parallel. I will not uh, read in Italian, uh, so you will have the pleasure, this pleasure only to my Italian accent when I speak in English. But it is possible to find some parallels with uh, Primo Levi, who wrote about uh, this existence of a book in uh, his mind when he was in the lager. Il libro avevo incominciato a scriverlo là. I, I, I began to write this book when I, I, I was in the lager. I had the impression, mi pareva questo libro di averlo già in testa tutto pronto. I had the impression that this book was already ready in my mind and I had only to, to make to let, he, to let it go out of my mind, di doverlo solo lasciare uscire e scendere, go fallen upon the, the paper, scendere sulla carta. And Shalamo, so uh, Primo Levi, I, I think I don't have, the, I don't have to introduce him, uh, but if this is the case, please uh, ask me. So a survival from, the, uh, from Auschwitz, of course. And uh, Shalamo, maybe he is less uh, known, but he was a survivor from the Gulag, so Stalin and Gulag. And uh, he wrote some book images about the Holima, donc the, it is the name of the Gulag uh, when he spent uh, many years. And, uh, you can find something similar. I had the impression that, that I had already this book in my mind when I was in the, in the Gulag. And I had the impression that le récit était déjà écrit. So the writing was already written before, <laughs> before to, to, to pass to the, to, to, to the paper. 
And uh, he gave a name to that. It is the name, I put it in, in red, Chernovik. I don't know if I pronounced good uh, this Russian name. So it is the idea of a draft. Les brouillons, s'ils existent, sont enfouis profondément dans les cerveaux. There was already a draft, a Chernovik, of this book of testimony that Chalavon wanted to, 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 to write. And I think that it's very important to compare so this uh, excerpt from Shalamo, from Primo Levi, with our Armenian author, because we find the same many years before Ausio, many years before the, the Stalinian terror, we find the same ideas. So I record it all, I had the impression that alre I already had a book in my mind. I just had to, well, to, to, to take my pen, my pencil and uh, some paper. Is it so simple? Not at all. Not at all. It's not simple at all, this enterprise. So they felt the duty to testimony, to, to give a written testimony, but it was a very difficult challenge. Uh, Balakian has uh, many expressions. It is humanly impossible to describe the horrible, unutterable, unbadmeli martyrdom of more than one million of your children dying. No pen could describe the moving side that awaited us outside. It is impossible to describe with the pen. No one would be able to describe by the pen. It is difficult to express through the pen, etc., etc., etc. So I, I have a a legacy, uh, I did a promise, I, fell, I feel this uh, uh, need to write, but I have to write an impossible uh, book, humanly impossible to describe. And uh, we can find the same words or similar words in the preface of uh, In the Ruins, so by Yesayan. It is difficult for me to give an entire idea. The words in their daily and usual meaning are incapable of expressing the terrible and unbadmeli picture that my eyes have seen. Here we have um, a little bit different idea. So not only the idea that it is an unbadmeli picture, so a picture that it was impossible to, to describe, to, to, to tell that uh, Esayan wanted to, to tell, but the idea that the words, even the common daily words, are empty, empty of uh, meaning. And you have the same idea in Primo Levi. La nostra lingua manca di parole per esprimere questa offesa alla demolizione di un uomo. There are no words in order to express the destruction of the man, the dehumanization of the man during, well, at Hausche, but also at Der, Der, Der Zor. And uh, Levi continues uh, telling that we have words, very common words, for example, uh, fame, so, how do you say, hungry, hungry, mm, angry? Fame. Fame, we're better in, in English. Sog, yeah. Okay, what? Sog in Armenian, famine in English. Yeah. No, 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 it's not uh, the English hunger. word. Hunger, hunger, hunger. okay, so thank, thank you, uh, hunger. And, uh, or for example, uh, f frightness, or pain, or uh, cold, so very common in daily words, but this word, uh, don't have uh, the, they, they are enough to express the same meaning uh, when you are writing about the experience of Auschwitz. So even the daily name are empty of, uh, of, uh, of meaning. So you find, uh, once more, it's possible to find some consideration in Primo mm. Levi, who is very much uh, more known. And you, you can find the similar, similar statements, similar ideas in uh, the Armenian writers uh, at the time of the, the Armenian genocide or before the massacres of uh, Cilicia. And uh, this idea of the, the fact that the words are powerless and meaningless um, is uh, stressed by Balakian. So he wanted to, to write an impossible writing, but he wanted to write an impossible writing, and he wrote his uh, Armenian Golgotha, Golgotha, his work. And uh, um, he told us when, well, I can uh, read the quotation, when I started working, I realized that I had almost forgotten my mother language. It was often hard for me even to remember the common words of Armenian and to write my thoughts in order to express my ideas in a suitable manner. In vain, I lingered in the Armenian dictionaries to search synonymous. So there is a kind of aphasia of the 
survival, survivor who wants to write in this uh, language uh, condemned to death. So of course it is only a temporary aphasia and it was uh, certainly not the Armenian dictionaries that could uh, help uh, Balakian. And by the way, some lines after this excerpt, he, he wrote, I was used to read the Armenian newspaper and uh, I was able to understand very easily. So it is another kind of aphasia. The aphasia, it is the aphasia of the witness that who has to write about the Meds Yeheren. So it is the, the difficult uh, link to this unbad melee, unutterable character of, the, of this enterprise of writing. Another aspect of this writing, of the, uh, the enterprise of writing, is the, the fear of not being believed by people who did not experience the Yeheren. I want to challenge myself, I want to, to write my testimony, I want to try to <coughs> do this Yeher Nabadum, and there is another fear, Balakian addressed to Armenian people, so the readership, the do not uh, wrote, do not have a single doubt concerning this Yeher Nabadum, do not believe that this written contains some intentional exaggerations, ex exaggerations. do not have a single doubt, all its True, but it was so, so unimaginable that uh, the writer has the fear that maybe you will, not, you will not believe me. It is too exaggerated, but I'm not exaggerating. This is the fear. And Odian wrote something similar in the post phase of uh, the cursed uh, years. This was the story of the three and a half years of my deportation. The readers, of course, will have noticed that I wrote in the simplest way, even in a very inaccurate style. Above all, I wanted to be a faithful teller who does not alter the facts and does not exaggerate. Yet, the reality was so frightening that many thought that there were that many thought that there were exaggerations in my writings. Only those who endured the sufferings of the deportation and who survived can testify that I did not alter the reality at all. So he chose to write in the simplest way, even in a very inaccurate sty style. So he chose, after all, a style, the more simple way, uh, the more simple way of, uh, of writing. Once again, it would be possible to compare the, the statement with the, the writings of um, Primo Levi. He was used to remind a nightmare, the nightmare that the, the people in Auschwitz had. They were used to have this dream. I, I will come back to my land to my family, I will tell, I will tell again, 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 I will tell what I experience, but my family will not believe me. And uh, Primo Levi really uh, told that uh, it was a very common nightmare, so the fear of not being believed. And we may find the same, uh, a similar purpose in, uh, in our Armenian writers. So <coughs> don't think that I'm exaggerating. Don't think, I know that what I'm telling is so unimaginable, something that anybody could imagine uh, uh, that it was uh, possible to, to live and to, to, to meditate, that I understand that only those who endure the sufferings and who survive can testify that they altered the reality. They can understand. So did you see the problem? The, the witness wants to give uh, his uh, testimony but he knows that it is impossible to give the in integrality of the testimony because only those who experience can understand the totality of this, uh, of this testimony. The other can't understand. It is impossible to understand and almost to believe that uh, su such things, such events uh, um, were um, um, affected uh, on human mankind. And uh, this may raise another question. Odian chose to write in a simplest way. Krikor Beledian called it la poétique de la simplicité. 
So it is a choose, it is a, a, a choose of a writer. And uh, Zabele Sayan has another position, another solution, if I may say that. Uh, he explained in the preface, painfully impregnated of the duty that was fallen upon me, I considered that it would have been a sacrilege to turn the suffering in which agonized the whole people into literature. So I approached this work with the greatest simplicity and the greatest respect. I considered that it would have been a sacrilege to turn the suffering into literature. So is the literature even possible? This is the question that it's known uh, about the literature, the Shoa literature, but it's very interesting. So that our Armenian writers, uh, our Armenian writers in 1917, uh, the time uh, when uh, Yesayanda wrote The Agony of the People, the Armenian writers had the same, uh, the same reflection, the same idea, the same uh, feelings. I have some time uh, again. Okay, okay. So I approach this work with the greatest simplicity and the great, greatest respect. Is literature a kind of uh, un respect when uh, you have to write about the Medjiheren? Well, this is what uh, she's, uh, she's uh, suggested uh, in a way. And uh, Shalamov told something similar. When people ask me what I am writing, what I am writing, I tell, I try to write not a narrative, but something that is not literature. I don't know what I, I'm writing, but I know that I'm, I try to write something that is not literature. So there are writers, there are writers, Shalamov, Yesayan, they're very good writers, and they refuse to write in a literary form when you have to write this kind of, uh, of testimony. It is um, something that they choose. They, they didn't explain with very stronger theoretical uh, reflection. We have that some years after with some other uh, Armenian uh, writers. But it's very interesting to see that there is a kind of, uh, well, the, this is the challenge. I am a writer. I need the duty of writing about uh, the genocide, about the Mezi Yecheren, but I feel uncomfortable in my position as a writer. So I feel that literature is something that maybe is an not, mm, it, it's not uh, inadequacy, adequate with, um, it doesn't suit with uh, this enterprise. And there is an exception, and it will be the last part of my lecture. As you see, I'm not reading, so. <laughs> uh, well, but I have to, to speak shortly. So, is literature even possible? We have the case of Balakian, so a Vardapet, so a very learned uh, man uh, who knows uh, the ancient Armenian uh, literature. He knows, he, he knew, uh, sorry, he knew of course the, the chronicles of the past, uh, the ancient Armenian historians, and uh, he wrote in, a, I found uh, in a, an article published in a newspaper in the same year uh, of the publication of the Armenian Golgotha, he wrote that he considered himself an epigony of the ancient chronographers. I want to, to be the chronographer of, uh, of the present. I want to be the new, I don't know, Mofses Horenazi, etc., the new Yeriche. He wanted to renew the model of the ancient literary tradition, which is, by the way, he wanted to renew the model of the ancient literary tradition, which is, by the way, an implicit rejection of the possibility of making literature about the disaster in the modern sense of the word. I try to, to, to employ a literary pencil, but it will be, but it is the ancient model, the, the model that I can um, take from the past that I want to employ. In particular, he reprised one feature of ancient Armenian historiography as a way of comprehending the crime. In their pages, the ancient Armenian chronicles represented suffering and forbearance during martyrdom as one of the core elements of Armenian identity. In their works, there is a, they established a link between death, martyrdom especially, and collective rescues, rescue. 
the Armenian people, for, for example, the most known example, all the Vardanank uh, died uh, on the plain of Avarair, but the death, the martyrdom of these uh, valiant, uh, brave uh, uh, Vardanank wasn't uh, unuseful because uh, they their, their death was for the collective rescue of the Armenian people. So this is the, the, the way of comprehending, the grid of comprehending the crime that Balakian tried to apply to the Medz Yeheren. And there is a very particular interesting um, vocabulary that we may find in his work. First of all, the vocabulary of suffering and uh, the rhetoric of martyrdom. Well, I will give some example. The victim are represented, portrayed as a Christ-like figure. So the deportees are Christ-like figures. Balakian chooses title subtitle, Armenian Golgotha, episodes of the Armenian martyrdom. The victims are called martyrs, the dying children of the Armenian people. Their names are sanctified by the martyrdom. The victims are sanctified by the ocean of the terrible afflictions. The corpses are sacred relics, uh, the night of April 24 is called Night of Gethsemane. The bitterness of the deportees is compared to the bitterness of Jesus during the Passion. The Armenianness is crucified. The innocent blood <coughs> spilled drop by drop for Jesus' rib is compared to the oceans of the innocent blood spilled by a million of Armenian martyrs. So it's very interesting, a comparison between the uh, blood spilled from Jesus' rib and the blood spilled by a million of Armenian martyrs. It means that the Armenian martyrs, the Armenian who died uh, uh, on the roots of the deportation, are participating of the passion of Christ. This is an idea suggested by Balakian. But in the Christian uh, um, theology, uh, the, the death of uh, Christ, of course, it is for the redemption of the humanity, of the mankind, of the humanity. So the death of the martyrdom, it was unuseful for Balakian. There is a, an idea of redemption. Which kind of redemption? Which kind of redemption? He tried to push, uh, to, to, to explain uh, this uh, idea. And, uh, mm, well, he, uh, I will, I will explain that. I want to insist to stress about uh, some points. He recalls, for example, that uh, so the, during the deportation, many missed the office and the holy sacrifice of the mass. He was a Vardapet, so he was told to, to celebrate the, the sacrament. But he told the mass and the sacrament of the Eucharist were not necessary. Why? Because the Armenian people as a whole was the sacrificial victim. So there is a substitution from the, 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 the sacrifice of the, Eucharist, of the Eucharist is the sacrifice of the Armenian on the roots of the deportation. So there is again this idea of a, re, of, of a redemption linked to that. This is the idea that Balakian uh, wants to suggest. He stressed to define the crime some, well, the, the, the character, um, the, the unprecedented nature of the crime. For example, you can see a monstrous crime that human history had never recorded even in its bloodiest pages. Or tragic events, appalling massive carnage never recorded in the annals of humanity. Even in the bloodiest pages of the history of peoples, we would not find a similar example. Though the unprecedented nature of the crime, of the genocide, would the, is uh, um, the, the crucial, the core nature of the, of the crime that Balakian wanted to, 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 to show. And uh, he stressed the intentional character of the crime. Balakian often mentioned the intentional character of the crime, but the words project, plan, huge political plan, Explicitly, he explicitly mentioned a plan of extermination, so he was very perfectly aware of uh, that there was a, a plan, a project, uh, a plan of extermination. And the word employed is the Armenian verb chenchel, which means to erase, to delay. This was the plan perpetrated by the Turks in 1915. This is another uh, important thing you can find in the work of uh, Balakian. 
and uh, he tried to um, give uh, the, the, the general frame, historical context uh, of the, the genocide. So you have some thoughts about the context of the uh, First uh, War. As we shall see, something that seemed impossible for everyone, so the unprecedented nature of the crime, so that seemed impossible for everyone, and even a matter of the region, through the World War it became possible. I must tell you emphatically that still we were unable to see the secret plan for what it was. For the extermination of a historic nation of a thousand years was unimaginable. Extermination of a historic nation. Even in the bloodiest periods of history, such a thing never happened. And uh, in another passage, uh, he stressed uh, about the lack of reaction by Europeans uh, or even uh, uh, the participation, uh, the, the, the complicity of the German allies. So he is very explicit uh, about that. And uh, even more uh, strong, he uh, complained an attack uh, against the Christian European civilization. So the Medziacheren was a martyrdom which taints the history of humanity tarnishes Christianity and reveal the failure of the famous European civilization of the 20th century. So you have here some uh, excerpts um, which show the way in which uh, Balakian uh, thought about the Meds Yecheren. And uh, in this context, uh, he um, proposed the idea of the Holocaust, so of the sacrifice, but the sacrifice, so the martyrdom, the Holocaust, the sacrifice for, with this idea of a redemption, possible redemption. And uh, he gave the political uh, nature to this redemption. Well, we, we will uh, see the passages. So homeless and without protection, so though persecuted and exiled, in the depths of our heart, there was a sacred and secret altar, where, like a flickering candle, the hope and inextinguishable light of the liberation of the homeland ravaged was still shining. We fervently wanted to see the amazing and marvelous resurrection of the Armenianess that was thought as dead and buried. In ascending Golgotha by thorny and bloody paths, the crucified and buried Armenianess would not resuscitate. So, he wants to suggest that there is some uh, hope, a possible resurrection. And uh, in the pages describing the deportation in Cilicia, Balakian stressed the idea that the bloody sacrifice of the half of the Armenian people was the sacrifice which made possible the liberation of Armenia. So this is the political um, content uh, of um, his interpretation. So if we have the Republic of Armenia, so he was thinking about the first Republic of Armenia, so 1918-1920, it was thanks, thanks to this sacrifice. I give you some <laughs> minutes of silence about this idea. He wrote that, first of all, he wrote that in 1922. So there, there was not at all uh, the first Republic of Armenia. It, it was becoming the Soviet uh, Armenia. So, but, well, all the Armenian generations, he wrote, today in the future must know that the holy tricolor flag flying Yerevan and the freedom and independence are the prize of more than one million of innocent victims. Still giving some <laughs> minutes of reflection. So this is the prize of more than one million of innocent victims. So, one, more than one million innocent victims, but it was not, uh, it was not, uh, well, we have a, a Latin expression, sine causa, this is an expression commonly used about the, the writing of Primo Levi, sine causa, it means you don't have, uh, it's not, it wasn't unuseful. They died, but for something, in order for some aim, and this is the liberation of the media. But he wrote that when it was just impossible to think it about. So she, he tried to give a possible sense to the Medzieheren, I mean, to something that is the absurd par excellence, to something that is the atrocity, something that has no, no sense at all. And th this was the challenge on the writers. Uh, I try to give sense, to, to, to explain in my testimony, in my writings, 
to something that have, has no sense at all, it is a difficult, it is unbatmeli, it is unutterable, it is something inimaginable. But Balakian tried to, well, to say something. Well, maybe it was not sine causa, without a meaning. Maybe it was a martyrdom, it was a death as a holocaust. I mean, uh, a, a death, uh, you have the idea of a sacrifice for something. The aim was the liberation of the Armenian and the possible resurrection of the Armenians as, as a nation. Well, it is a nonsense, of course, in my opinion. But what it is interesting, it is the approach. He refuses to give the character of without sense, nonsense, sine causa to the crime. He refuses to, to recognize that it was something totally absurd uh, for which there are no human thoughts, no human words enough uh, to express. So you have another, another solution given by this Balakian and uh, he tried to, to take some model of uh, some way, some feature of uh, comprehended by the ancient literature, by the, the time of the ancient time uh, uh, were past. So the, the situation was totally different and uh, he also stressed the unprecedented nature of the crime. So the model offered by the atrocities uh, that the Armenian lived in the past uh, was uh, totally different. So I think that it's time to stop. I wanted to read what I carefully <laughs> wrote, but normally I prefer to, to, to talk and not to read. This was my challenge and endeavor, and probably yours also. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for the talk. Uh, I'd, I'd like to open up the floor if there are any questions, queries, comments. Yes. Thank you for your talk, that was excellent. Um, can I ask you, what's your view, how much of it, how much of these writings were driven not only to, to testify, but also for the desire of healing, uh, the healing process, either consciously or subconsciously, not only for the writers, but for s also for our people? Yes, it's a, a, a very interesting uh, question. So the question of healing, uh, yes, it is uh, related to the question of the... Oh, I think it's, uh, it's okay. Uh, okay, I think it's okay, so thank you. Yes, it is the, the healing about the uh, trauma, of course. So, and uh, it is very present, this aspect also in this literature. Maybe it is something that I have to, yes, to, to, to stress uh, more. But it, it, I think that, in especially in Balakian, he wants to suggest, uh, yes, uh, some some hope, of course. So, in this respect, is also thank you, thank you very much. I mean, um, I don't really see why you're worried about giving a lecture in English because I thought it was excellent. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I've seen nothing to worry about. Um, now, it, it's a re I mean, I have so many questions, but I mean coming from your question is, mm -hmm. it's very interesting to actually see that what he's actually saying there in the last paragraph sort of continues today. So they died so that there mm -hmm. could be an inde mm -hmm. independent Armenian Republic there, they're all martyrs. So mm -hmm. last year you see the canonization of the victims of the Armenian genocide, which in yes. my opinion is complete nonsense. Um, and and um, for example, sort of this year, they, s they created this um, um, almost Disney-fied icon, yeah. which basically purported to represent those who'd actually um, died for Armenia, etc. So, um, I mean, the question is, is how can you sort of tie in what Balakian's thinking is on this particular matter? So when he actually says in 1922, they died so that the holy tricolor can actually fly, blah, 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 to today um, and the 100th anniversary or the 101st anniversary of the Armenian genocide and the state basically saying they died. I mean, it's exactly the same it's vocabulary same. which is being oh, used. Yes, so, but for the context of today, so... Um, 
I'm not quite sure whether there's a question in here, but... Um, well, I had yeah. a very provocative sentence in my very long uh, you like provocative, <laughs> paper. Please. Mm. So uh, I don't know if I will find, but uh, I had the, this statement, well, provocative, but kind of provocative. But, uh, it is, uh, this is an idea, so the, this image of uh, martyrdom people is still sticking <laughs> on the skin of the Armenians, and I think it, it's time to... To, to forget it, your martyrdom. I don't want to say that it's time to not uh, want a reparation, uh, to, to the, have to say the recognition, etc., etc. Of course, uh, or to, to continue to, to write even because it's possible to write about that, even by uh, writer from our <coughs> generation. Mm. It's still. Uh, there, there are attempts in, in this case, but this idea, we are not died uh, for nothing. Uh, well, no, uh, <laughs> it is a, a way to, not to a, a give an excuse, but to give, oh, at, after all, there was a sense, but no, it is a nonsense. This is the idea of the plan of extermination. There are survival, of course, with the trauma, with the necessity of uh, healing, uh, of course, and to, 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 to find the uh, words to, 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 to tell about that. I, I would like it, it's different. So, yes, I, I totally agree with you. I totally agree with you. And there is an image. So, as a, as a responsible chair of Armenian Studies, of course, I, I give lecture about these uh, writers. Uh, I give lecture about Armenian, contemporary Armenian history. But I, I really wanted to show that <laughs> there is much more. That I, for example, picture, art, uh, music, and uh, another kind of literature. And uh, so uh, sometimes I have the impression that even the Armenians <laughs> forgotten that this uh, cultural past. Well, this is another question, of course, but, uh, well, yes, I agree. <coughs> How much do you think that his ideas were confused by his religious beliefs and that yeah. this idea of martyrdom mm -hmm. uh, was also a matter of ignorance about the political background mm -hmm. of the Armenian genocide? and the aims of the Turkish government mm -hmm. by killing and deporting all the Armenians. Uh, yes, but uh, if I, I propose to your attention uh, different past and different experts, it was to show that uh, the same Balakian uh, recalled the intentional project uh, by the Turkish. So he is very explicit. And another um, side of his work, it is the, the fact that they, they, he said, I, I, I want to, to collect information to, test him, to testify, but also in order to, to find proofs, mm -hmm. a proof of the event. So, no, I think that he had a political awareness. And, uh, but, well, he was a, a Vardapet. He was a Varapet, so with a, of course, a, a theological position. So, of course, uh, it is the Vardapet who wrote, but even a Vardapet who wrote about the fact that it is the Republic of Armenia and the, this, the final, I can say, the, he, he seems to. <coughs> He seems to be desperate to oh, yeah. find mm -hmm. some mm -hmm. kind of yes. reason. Yeah. And he's gone to yeah. the supernatural religious line because it seems to me that he could not find a, an objective mm -hmm. reason in the reality he was living in. Mm -hmm. And that uh, he has somehow not only found some sort of supernatural reason, mm -hmm. but also he found some sort of achievement of that uh, suffering, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is not really related to what happened later on politically about the independence of Armenia. Mm -hmm. uh, th that had nothing to do with the massacres. Yeah, so it, it shows, uh, 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 in, in fact, uh, it shows th this impossibility to find uh, a meaning to, uh, yes. to something that has not meaning. This, uh, there is a disturbing uh, a project, a problem in this. 
I had another passage excerpt. By your painful martyrdom, you opened a new era, giving to the Armenian people a new life and a new sun and new glorious fields of action. Yes, it was a uh, in hope more than uh, something. It yeah, no, no, it also religious. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, taken from ancient texts. Mm -hmm. Of, yeah, 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 yeah. Of yeah. Uh, yeah. religion, of the yeah. martyrs, of, mm -hmm. of uh, various uh, persecutions. Mm -hmm. I had tried, I, I must confess that I had another slide. I tried to, to summarize all this complicated mm. Balakian. Very difficult to read Balakian. Very, very Would you say he's the most complex character? The most complex writer out of them? In terms and much of the more complex because uh, uh, normally we say that there are uh, writers uh, like Yesayan uh, in the 17 or Odian who. I don't want to do literature when mm. I have, I'm testifying, I'm writing to testify. But the Balakian w wants to, to employ his talent uh, as, a, as, a, as a writer with the contents of these ancient. Uh, the past uh, references, the past uh, models, uh, but well, it, it was a nonsense. You 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 told uh, very well that it, it was I impossible to, to, to find uh, something. So he does this. It did, how do you say the? It's a Yes. Yes. Yeah. This is the idea. So yes. Thank it's you for it's giving it's me also, words. It is also uh, like biblical. Uh, yeah, it, yeah, yeah, this yeah. event had to happen so that the consequence came. Uh, th th and it sounds as if that event had to happen, the massacres, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that th the Armenian independence mm -hmm. came. But they were not related. It was yeah, like it sort was of related, uh, yeah. almost th like uh, a sacrifice to God. So that yeah, God yeah, yeah, yeah. gives it, 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 uh, something. In this way, it was sacred. Yes. Yes. As, uh, told, you know, you make a sacrifice mm -hmm. uh, and ask God to give you something, some favor, yeah. and then mm -hmm. you sacrifice a million and half Armenians yes. so mm -hmm. that you have independence. Which Maybe if sacrifice three million, that would be better. Excuse me. If we sacrifice three million, that would be better for us. How could that be? The well, problem that he, we would have had more land. He could yes, stay in Israel on the theological aspect. It was a Vardapet, so it know, was a Vardapet, so we won. We well, it was uh, <coughs> legit. Uh, thank you. That was yeah, very interesting uh, talk. Uh, you mentioned something uh, during um, a little bit earlier in our Q and A session um, about um, it's time to forget uh, and shed that skin of you know remembering it. But um, I come from Armenia, the independent tricolor uh, from Yerevan, and um, I was uh, actually quite uh, small when events in Baku and Sumgait happened, mm -hmm. and they to me they are just continuation of. Uh, it's just a small scale and I think if we had more Armenians there they would probably would have lost as many um, so um, uh, just from f looking from from that perspective I think that also was the price for our year going to be there um, today and also that recent war in April as well we, we paid the price and we are still paying the price today on board uh, every day I don't know uh, uh -huh. yeah. So, well, so uh, do you think we still have to forget? Because if we forget, I didn't say that we have oh. to forget. No, no, no at all. No. No. Uh, so in my question, I was basically saying that by, for example, canonization, mm. sort of, you know, we're basically trivializing what really, really happened. We're basically belittling it ourselves. So no one is forgetting, certainly not forgetting, absolutely not. No, 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 um, it's not about forgetting at all. Yes. But the thing is, it's, it's putting together, um, trying to explain the deaths of one and a half million people um, by the establishment of the Armenian Republic in Russian Armenia or in Eastern Armenia, completely different place, um, five year, uh, sorry, three years later. Th these are two um, sort of unrelated events. So what I think Valentina and was, was saying and, and what I was trying to ask with my questions, not, not very well, I guess, um, was, was that um, 
I was finding it really, really interesting that in 1922 he was trying to explain something which is so difficult to explain. And the only way he actually was able to actually write something down is by saying that these people died so that the Armenian Republic so that, that's, that's a whole thing. But I mean, again, but what, what you just said about Sumgait and the, and the Garapal War, etc. cetera. Um, these are completely different things to the Armenian genocide in scale and, and, and in historical context. So the way we basically tie all these things together, every time something happens, when, a, uh, when an Armenian s soldier is killed in Abluk um, in, in, in in Turkey, we basically say, oh, it's genocide again. When Haran Dink basically gets murdered, we say one and a half million plus one, Kesab, genocide, genocide, genocide. We are ourselves trivializing the memory of the genocide. And then by basically putting a Disney-style painting in our churches, I mean, it's idiotic. It really is. I, I find it really, really insulting. Really insulting. As, as a grandson of four genocide survivors, I find it really, really insulting to look at a painting in a church, okay, sanctioned by the Gatorigos, which is supposed to be representing uh, the suffering of my grandparents. That is nonsense. It's absolute nonsense. So we were just reducing our history to um, just small bites so that anybody will be able to understand it. To you what extent would it, the trivialization <coughs> be um, measured? For example, it, it reminds me of an essay on what uh, they were saying about sacrilege. They don't want to write about the, anything because it's trivializing, as you said, writing about it trivializes, it takes away from the whole scale of it, and it'd be teetering on just leaving it alone because it's, it's so unique in character as well. Uh, w in terms of the talk, I don't know who I'm aiming this question at. It's anyone, I guess. Uh, that, that point actually is really interesting. It, it hit a nerve with me in terms of the, um, the sacrilege and taking the idea of the genocide for own purposes in terms of literature because in our generation there's a rapper in Armenia, an Armenian guy, uh, sorry, in um, America, and he, he's got a big um, campaign with Armenian symbols and stuff and it's like uh, our, our wounds are still open, uh, but he's making money out of it, selling it. So it's, it's the idea of not propaganda but propagating the Armenian genocide, the troops of it, but in a more entrepreneurial sense. So. What would the writers essay on these themes that have been taken, saying we can't t touch the topic in different styles? We can try write about it, but it's un 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 you can't talk about it. You can try talk to someone about it. You can try sell a T-shirt which has um, a phrase on it, but in the end, it is un -Mali. It's something which can't comprehend. It's something because y yes, um, Balakian had the same idea because he stressed the uh, unprecedented nature of the crime. So the idea of unbad melee, of a natural and he, he had also this idea. But, but maybe I will, I'm not uh, answering to your question. But, uh, yes, I had another, he, he understood that the, the, there was even no literature, model in the literature uh, that was capable, is it uh, um, suitable to, mm. to express uh, this, uh, this yeah. suffering, etc. But he, she wrote in, at, the, at yeah. the same time, of course, because they, 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 there is this, this one of the aporia, apom, aporia, apori? Apuria, it is a Greek name, so after all, I can pronounce <laughs> it Greek. <laughs> so the, the difficulties, uh, so it is impossible, you, I, 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 I'm, telling to you, you my readers, uh, but at the same time I will write. Uh, I know that it, it is impossible to give the testimony the, the, in its entirety. And Primo Levi, again, but many years after he told uh, the testimony integral, how do you say, the whole, the testimony uh, integral, no, the full, complete test um, witness, it doesn't exist uh, because who would be able to testify all the horrors, who uh, the people who died in the lager, but they, they are not here to testify. So it is impossible to give a complete testimony. It doesn't mean that uh, he didn't wrote, he didn't write, of course. Primo Levi, he, he even uh, told that he had the, the book in, uh, in his mind, even in the lager. So there is this duty, this willingness uh, to, to write, but at the same time, the consciousness, the awareness that uh, something, it was incomplete, incomplete uh, in the meanings. Uh, and yes, I am expressing this uh, in this way. So. Um, I think the most difficult thing for me to accept of Balakian's mm -hmm. thing 
he is putting an inevitability of the massacres because he's relating them yeah. to God. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, God almost, I mm. feel that he thinks God wanted these massacres mm. to happen. Yeah. Uh, mm. And then the prize was an independent homeland. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, one can follow that reasoning and uh, have a lot of arguments about that sort of thinking. But that seems to me uh, what he's thinking, the inevitability. So that creates another problem. So the Turks are not responsible. They are only a tool in the hands of God well, maybe he to commit the massacre that mm -hmm. God decided mm -hmm. for the Armenians so that he gives them a piece mm -hmm. of land of their own Mm -hmm. uh, which is their own anyway. It ties in with the word uh, I, I this, think is, that this is also mm -hmm. uh, a lot in different religions mm -hmm. as well, that everything happens in the world, it's decided by God. So if somebody goes and I murders somebody, mm -hmm. or goes and rapes somebody, or does somebody something, it's not him. He's not. He's only a tool. He's not guilty of murder. He's not guilty of rape. I understand. I understand. It's but it, God. It's not the intention of Balakian because he's very explicit when uh, he wrote about the responsibility of the Turks. Really, really. And uh, maybe I had to mention that you know, of course, the trial. Uh, uh, against uh, so Roman Telirian, so Balakian was one of the witnesses in a well, so in a, in a, even in a trial. So he 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 endeavored to to, to prove uh, uh, against the the Turks. Or the, he didn't want to discharge or to, to remove the responsibility on the Turks. But there is another conception of the martyrdom in the Christian uh, doctrine. It is not God who decided it, uh, because don't forget the for the Christianity, the humankind has the the, the the freedom to choose. So it's not God who decided it, but the consequences are probably maybe different from the what the perpetrators, the, the criminals uh, uh, were expected. So there is, after all, uh, something, I don't want to say positive, but uh, well, a, a good consequence, this liberation, resurrection of the Armenianists uh, that he wants to see in this uh, republic. Uh, so it's not a way to to say, after all, it was, it was not the responsibility of the Turk, because he, he has uh, some pages uh, absolutely, for me, also disturbing with the, all the topo, the stereotyped the image of the Turkish, from Genghis Khan, the Mongols, etc., etc., with a, a, a great confusion about the origin of the <laughs> of this uh, ethnic community. But in order to show that it is uh, almost uh, natural for a Turk to be uh, a, a barber, and uh, as well <coughs> it is uh, natural for the Armenia, it's so positive and uh, to have a resurrection. So it is also disturbing. I have to say the modern translator of Balakian cut <laughs> some passages uh, disturbing for our sensibility of course but we have to respect the text uh, so uh, yeah, it is disturbing of course <laughs> I understand very well your your reaction but please don't I don't want to be misleading so the Turks are the criminals for Balakian but he wants to go at, at, at another level and uh, uh, no, in English. With, uh, yeah, no, in the, no, no, the translation in French, uh, yes. Cat is something. Yeah, yeah. Yes. yes, thanks. An Bakmeli, An Haskanali, all those words are very normal, and this is the challenge for every artist, for every writer. Mm -hmm. Whenever we are faced with something that we cannot explain in the beginning, we always try to do something. And the Chinese saying is magnificent, says that one picture is worth 10,000 words, because it's very difficult to find a proper explanation to what the tragedies happened. And that was exactly what Lenkin himself was tortured, because he wanted to understand what's happening. And interestingly enough, all those writers, they wrote before that word was created, genocide. And we never 
mentioned about genocide. We mentioned about the Armenian tragedy of genocide only after Lemkin. Lemkin was the first to say what happened to the Armenians was genocide. And interestingly, the Armenians are the only one, it seems to me, that they translated that word, the others are still using the, the old concept of Yehe and this and that. And the whole concept, now let's not forget, Balakan was a religious man himself. We should understand that. He was a uh, reverend, I think, if I'm not wrong, mm -hmm. Balakan, mm -hmm. yes, and Protestant reverend. The, the idea is that Apostle. even before Yehren was used, we used Holocaust. And that is exactly what the terminology comes. Even in 1885, Armenians used that word Holocaust. Mm -hmm. And that comes from the Bible. Interestingly, you know, it is exactly what Balakan wants to understand. And it is very normal for a kind of person that he is. Because it is a sweet savior in Leviticus, it says. But the trouble is that they don't understand one thing. That it says that to, to cleanse your sins, whose sins are cleansed by Holocaust? And that is atrocious, of course. Later on, we understood. And the Armenians, of course, they started using genocide. The others are still Shoah, this and that, and even the Kurds are using Sefer, which is ridiculous in the sense that they think that it is just killing by salt. And they never think to translate that magnificent word that Lemkin was tortured to find out. And in difference between him and the other who explained about it, he thought that that happened throughout the history. It was not something new the Holocaust or the genocide itself. So it is not the first time that it happened for the Armenians as such, because it was happening also before. What I mean is that here it is very important. So it is exactly the same thing what Lincoln was tortured to find out, understand this tragedy. And all those writers, apart from what they are explaining, they are trying to understand. That's why they say, Ambadmeli, Anaskanali. And sometimes in Armenian language, it's magnificent. We use the negative whenever we want to show an extreme uh, uh, concept. Anaskanali, Ambadmeli, Anyerevagaili, when it is too much of Yerevagaitun and too much of Badmeli, we use the negative to emphasize the other aspect of it. So it is very normal, those things that they are, but this all happened before it was created, that word, genocide. And that was in 1948. Now, I was wondering, of course. I, I would like to react to this first part. Maybe we can, we can ask the question after. If not, I, I will forget what I, I want oh, okay. to, to, to okay. say. <laughs> so so okay, you're welcome. If, uh, no, 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 keep, 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 keep your microphone. I, I, uh, but just a first part I, I your just wanted to, to react then. after. No, no, I, it's I'm okay. glad to, 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 to have uh, this yeah. discussion. Yes, of course, uh, Lemkin uh, wrote uh, in '44, uh, and uh, but this is, it, it, yes, it is very important to recall that we have survival who wrote immediately after the deportation, after the genocide. And if Balakian wrote about the unprecedented crime, it was a crime for which even the name uh, lacked at that time time because it is a crime that didn't exist before that nobody uh, uh, even imagined to perpetrate this is what Balakian and all the other survival told so they used a vocabulary who uh, which w was very um, strong uh, with a longer tradition in Yeheren, Ahed, Aksor um, it, there are a lot of words, yeah. common words and not other words, in order to express the events, and not only the events, uh, the, the, the evil and the devastating consequences of the events. Because, for example, Ahed catastrophe is not only the genocide, the plan of the Turkish and the death of one and a half million of Armenians. It's all that the, the consequences for you Armenians, I'm not Armenian, but I, 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 I feel a participation in, in this situation of the diaspora. So it is all, also the consequences of that. So genocide, it was a very good word for the, how do you say, uh, 
la la où Quand le jury, pour, d'un point de vue juridique, it was, uh, of course, it was uh, fantastic to have this word, but it, it, it means the events, events for the historian, the events for the jurist, for the lawyer, but it, it, it is also un, insufficient, it's not enough in order to express the Yecheren, which is much more, uh, it is not only the genocide, not only the plan of extermination, but it is, it in, in involves all the consequences. Uh, one of the consequences, well, now I want to employ the Armenian vocabulary, my talent as a writer, and I feel unable because I have the impression that I will Three. <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> <laughs> you are my <laughs> consulate, <laughs> dictionary consulate. Ils ont l'impression de trahir la catastrophe. <laughs> if uh, the trade, trade, yes. If I will express in, an, in, in a way that it's not complete and at the same time I know that it was impossible to give a complete idea of the catastrophe, of the disaster, well, I, I will be a traitor of the catastrophe themselves, of the victims. So it is, uh, if you notice, I paid attention to the words because it is my, <laughs> my approach to the, all the, 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 the text, not only this kind of text of the Yeheren. There are a lot of discussion about Yeheren, Ahed, catastrophe, disaster, genocide. All these words have uh, a, an origin and a, and a, a meaning and, a, and, a, and, a, and utilization. They are employed with particular meanings and especially in this literature. Of course, they couldn't uh, employ this word because as you told, it is a, a more recent uh, word, but you don't have to forget that even when the Zerhaspanutyun genocide didn't exist, these survivors, these right survivors, found some words in order to express what uh, happened and what the, the trauma uh, they felt and the, well, all the devastating consequences of the, of the year. And I prefer to employ the words of my authors. <laughs> I have the impression I respect them. So this is the first reaction of, to your, I don't know if we are on the same. Yeah, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> You did mention Shalamov, the Sandat, but it's interesting that there were lots of Armenian intellectuals who went to Sibir. Mm -hmm. I would have loved yes, to I hear, compared to Kurken Mahari, for example, okay, sure. I would have loved to hear mm -hmm. comparison between this and those writers too. That is another subject, of course. I'm yes, not criticizing yes, yes. on I the contrary. Lecture, it just it gave me an idea Geneva that last year it would be very interesting to mm -hmm. uh, open that mm -hmm. dialogue mm -hmm. between what happened there and how they explained, having in mind what tragedy they, mm -hmm. the Armenian people had already survived. Mm -hmm. So that will Burgen be interesting. Mahari wrote a, a, a wonderful book translated in French. I don't know if you have uh, the Barbelles en Fleur. I don't know if you have an, an English translation. A book published in Lebanon before a publication in Yerevan. And uh, it is about his experience in the Gulag. So he lived twice this experience, many years of uh, his uh, life uh, in the Siberia. You don't find this approach. You don't find this uh, kind of, uh, of statement about the fact it is uh, unutterable. You don't find it at all. So of course, I think th there are very few Maybe there are not at all essays about the literature of Gurgen Mahari, this literature about the deportation in, in the Gulag. And uh, it is uh, a field that uh, it's worth to be studied. I, I don't say studied more, to study. <laughs> Somebody will study. So it's very important. It's not possible to compare uh, the words uh, written by Mahari about the Gulag and uh, these, uh, these works. The, it's more relevant to compare what Shalamot thought because you find some similarities. So it was the, the aim of my approach. A lot of the Armenian writers who, a lot of the Armenian writers who were sent to Siberia died uh, without writing anything. And Kulken Mahari was one of the exceptions who survived mm -hmm. and had the opportunity to write about it. So, uh, 
if the ones who died survived, not just Armenians, but other Russians and other nations, it would have been probably very interesting to see what they expressed, how they expressed themselves about their experiences, and what kind of experiences they had as individuals. Mm -hmm. But that's, you know, obviously the dead people don't talk. Yes, yes, this is what maybe told. Um, we have some information um, that Antonina Mahari, Kurge Mahari's yeah, yeah, Lithuanian yeah, wife, who yeah. he met in, in mm -hmm. the Gulag, sort of, you know, in her memoir, so she does talk about that. But I want to ask a completely different question. Um, um, it was really interesting, I mean, Zabel Yesayan as, 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 as a writer. I, for me, she's probably the most extraordinary Armenian writer of all time. She's, she's magnificent. And everybody has heard of Aviv Akhenemumech among the ruins, and it's been translated and really, really well known, etc. Now, I'd never heard of Jean Wotim Hokebaki, even mm -hmm. though um, I knew that sort of, you know, she had um, collected um, eyewitness accounts in uh, Tiflis and, and the rest of the Caucasus mm -hmm. in 1917, etc. Muradi Jampov Tutuna, she spoke to Sebastian Simu at the Fedai and, and basically told his story. Um, but I'd never heard of Jean Wotim Hokebaki, Agony of a People. Um, is it is it is it not well known at all? And 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 why would everybody uh, talk about Aviv um, about uh, the, the about the massacres in Galicia, but um, no one really discusses this particular work published in 1917 about the genocide? Okay, first reason: if you want to read it, simply to read it, yeah, and this is one it. of the consequences of the catastrophe, of course. You have to go, for example, to the Nubar Library, Very happy. and to have the. Uh, I, okay, sorry, I want to show. So it is in Gorz, in this. These writings are still in the same uh, um, place of pub publication. So in some periodical published in Baku in 70s, could you imagine? So you can't go to a library and hope to find this Armenian work. This work of Zabel Esayan, uh, the work of uh, Odian, published as a volume only in uh, 2004. So there is, the, the first problem is the, the, they are not accessible. And this is a problem of the, of the literature, and especially the Western Armenian literature. So they are inaccessible sometimes. So you don't, you, you even can't found in your, on your past that uh, Zabel Esayan uh, wrote this work. And uh, if you, now you know, but if you want to read it, you have two possibilities. You may go to Paris and it's very well, or you have to write me, <laughs> I will give you the, 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 PDF. the, yeah, the PDF on the, all the pictures <laughs> I took at the Dinovarian. So this is the, the, the situation of the Armenian literature today. But we have a French translation now that Marc yeah. Nishanian uh, published, uh, I think, two years ago. So the French translation with an essay at the end, it is, uh, it is uh, very important. I discovered before because I, I decided to spend some days at the Dubar Library where I found uh, uh, really a very important uh, works uh, that... Uh, it's um, a treasure trove. It, it is it a really treasure, is yeah, a it treasure. is a treasure. <laughs> so it is in this yeah. gorge, this uh, periodical of Baku. And, yeah. uh, How does it compare to Avila Knevumech in terms of, 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 of volume and, and in terms of um, sure, sure, sure. Oh, it's, it's much shorter yeah yeah, yeah. No, not too much but a is it an essay or is it a no, no, it is really the, 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 the journal in, in a way of the deportation of this Haig Toroyan so what is important that Isabelle uh, Essayan wrote the preface and I, I gave you some excerpts from the preface so she explained why he decided not to write literature about that so I will record what Haik Toroyan told me. And it is a way to, to guarantee the veracity of the testimony of um, Toroyan himself. So it is as if he decided to, to put a distance uh, mm -hmm. between the writing mm -hmm. and the... So it's a voice uh, of yeah, Haik Toroyan yeah, rather than yeah, Zabelia Sarans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the preface is very important. And in this journal, well, you have in the contents, table of contents, you have only the name of Zabel Fayan because so <laughs> she is the writer at the same time, that's fine. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Can I just yeah. say something in response to what was said earlier about the uh, trivialization of the concept no, of yeah. genocide? Mm -hmm. I would like to, in, in the words of Professor Armen Ivazian, he describes it as a, an organic extension of the genocide, what is going on. 
now in Artsakh or what has been going on over the decades. So equally, we cannot trivialize the life of a soldier who is shot on our borders defending our land. It is described as a, I believe it is an organic extension of the genocide, if not, uh, if you like, the genocide itself. It, the, the consequences go on we, and... We'd have to leave this discussion for outside yeah. of the lecture though. Sure, I just wanted to... Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, but we'll, we'll definitely talk about this after the lecture. Uh, but I'd, li I'd like to say a massive thank you for the amazing talk you gave. I really enjoyed it personally as well, learning about the different writers and their opinions on the genocide and how they came about formulating them. And I'm, I'm sure the audience did well with the amount of questions we received in the comments. So another round of applause, please, for Professor Kazali. Thank you.